Hello, everybody. I want to say, say, first of all, happy Valentine's Day to everybody out there. I hope you're having wonderful plans with your loved ones today and towards the evening. And I'm grateful for you to spend a little time on your Valentine's Day to talk about uh, lean construction. This is obviously Brian Hunt, and welcome to my show, Risk On, Risk Off. Um, as we know, this is our fourth episode. And what we'd like to do here is talk about risk and various functions and how it impacts, uh, you know, pertaining towards maybe construction and commercial real estate. And as any some of them I know, my background, I had the good fortune of working uh, a little stint in construction and also industries. Wasn't there very long, but I learned a lot. And one of the things I learned there very quickly was that, especially in our general contractors, you know, as we call it paper GC or zero self perform, there's a lot of moving parts that's required to get a job done on time and under budget. And a lot of things can go wrong. And, you know, you know, I think as we all talk about, you know, in the industry, construction being one of those industries that is very slow on the uptake to try to adopt new things. So I mentioned old school mentality is like, well, I've been doing it 20 years and making money. Why don't you change anything? But we all know if you, you hate, if you don't like change, you're going to hate being irrelevant even more. And along those lines, there's been initiatives to try to improve, you know, the flow of construction to make it hopefully less stressful, more efficient. And as I can call, you know, lean. And I'll give you an introduction to that because when I was in construction at Austin, I learned very quickly firsthand that one of the most important people in the entire organization is not the CEO, the CFO, or the estimator. It is the actual general superintendent on the job doing the work, trying to get a project done. There's a lot of moving parts and a lot of things that person has to juggle to get everybody happy. There's a lot of owners of that job, and he's the one who's at the point of the spear. And during my time frame, I kind of just learned to appreciate that, that there's a lot of pressure on that and what can be done to hopefully make things more efficient or improve the odds of getting a project done, reducing waste, reducing potential slip and falls, risks, disruptions, anything that could possibly extend the, the time to get that job open on time. And every now and then you get a book you read that thinks, wow, this is a great account as far as what it can be, as far as to be a superintendent and the risks that could be part of a job. And I had the great pleasure of reading not too long ago a book by the name of The Lean Builder. Hopefully you guys can see this it's on my iPad and I bought it by iPad. Um, kind of a little glare there. And there were two authors of this book and I've had the good fortune to know two of them, uh, Keon Zandi and Joe Donnarumma. Uh, both these gentlemen have very extensive experience with respect to construction and how it takes to be involved in lean construction. And so I have the very good fortune to introduce to you right now, Mr. Joe Donnarumma. He is the vice president for field operations of Limbeck, and he is also one of the principals at the Lean Builder and the co-author of the Lean Builder. So at this point, I'd very much like to introduce Mr. John, Joe Donnarumma. Joe, how are you, sir? Hey, I'm good, Brian. How are you, man? Doing fantastic. So again, I know, Joe, you are a very busy man, and I know Kenyon is too, but thanks for taking time to come out and talk to us. And uh, before we get into yeah, it, you know, before I get into it, I'd like to see, you know, kind of like, I think you might appreciate this joke. I think we're close to age and there used to be an old educational software game called Where in the World is Carmen San Diego? So where in the world is Joe Donnarumma today? <laughs> That's right. Uh, I am on the east side of Austin at the mm -hmm. moment, uh, pulled over at a gas station, and I am uh, en route to Houston to go uh, visit with one more of our project teams before the, the day is over. So I am on the road today. Well, Joe, really appreciate taking the time and pulling over to talk to me at the gas station. I, I know it's, yeah, absolutely. your time is your time is busy. I'm going to try to make it as efficient as possible, but I'm grateful for the opportunity. So, sure. Joe, I, before we get far into you know, your career and your book, I'd just like to maybe just spend a little time to say, you know, tell us a little about your background, where you came, where you grew up, where you went to high school, and how you kind of yeah. got, how did the construction bug get to you? Um, absolutely. So I grew up in Granbury. Um, for those of you who are around the DFW Metroplex, kind of southwest of Fort Worth, about 45 minutes. Um, grew up there, uh, had a great childhood, great, um, great place to grow up as a kid. Uh, and it was actually in high school. Um, I loved being outdoors. I loved welding. I love hauling hay. I just kind of, you just being very tactical with my hands and being outside. And I, I think I just, had a, a natural affinity for construction. And I remember um, my senior year of high school kind of thinking what's kind of next in my life, what am I gonna be doing? And I had this vision in my mind that being kind of successful in construction was like having a nice big new truck and having some crews and building some houses. And that was like the epitome of success in the construction industry when I was in high school. And 
uh, I chased that passion. I ended up going to uh, Oklahoma State University up in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Um, and that's really where I uh, became exposed to commercial construction. I actually did a few internships, um, Syntex Homes. Uh, at the time, I'd come back and I did some internships and I was in that you know, big home builder type of environment and realize I really think uh, commercial is, is more of where my passion aligns and started making the transition uh, to commercial construction through my um, through my schooling. Um, last couple of years of school, I ended up um, I don't know how I, I ended up capturing two really kind of coveted scholarships with a company called Flint Co. Okay. Um, yeah based out of Tulsa. They were doing a lot of work on Oklahoma State University's campus. In my junior and, and senior year, I got a full-time uh, scholarship to work while I went to school, and I was able to kind of cut my teeth. This was at the time when T. Boone Pickens uh, had gave one of the largest donations in uh, NCAA uh, history for to a sports program. It's like $160 million, and we were in the process of updating the football stadium at Oklahoma State, so I got to cut my teeth on that job while I was still in school. And um, upon graduating, obviously natural fit, uh, my first few years in the industry were with Flint Co. Um, and then in 2013, so at this point in time, I'm, I'm now married. Uh, I married my high school sweetheart, actually while I was still in college. Her name's Tosh. And uh, we, had, we had our first son, Karsten, thank you. Um, and my wife uh, was pregnant with our second son, Kaiser at the time. And I just remember, we just felt it on our hearts. It was time to get back to Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, both of our families, uh, at the time, her parents lived in kind of the Azel area. Uh, my family still lived in Granbury, and uh, it was time to to move back home. So we actually picked Alito, Texas. That's where we live current day, because uh, it was kind of right in between both families. It was a quick commute into Fort Worth, um, and uh, that's also where my my journey began with Lynn Becker. Um, so I was in the process of relocating, came back, uh, had the opportunity to interview with Mark Lindenberger, uh, who at the time was the GM over at, at Lindbeck in the Fort Worth office. And I remember going in, you know, for an hour long interview. And I think about two and a half, three hours later, I remember walking out of that office 100% um, certain that that's the firm I'm going to go work for. And that's the guy I'm going to go work for as well. Uh, and that's it. I mean, that was kind of history, uh, kind of how I got to Lindbeck and, and the journey there. Fantastic. So obviously, uh, you know, I've had the pleasure of going to my work. I travel a lot from Texas to the surrounding states. I've been to Oklahoma City quite a bit and got to know about the, the reputation that Flinko has and you know, sure. Lynn Buck does as well. So at what point in your career did the concept of lean start getting in your head? Yeah. So um, shortly after you know, joining Lindbeck, I became uh, aware of, of lean tools and methodologies and the principles because it was it was ingrained in the part of their operating system i think like my aha moment um, where it really all kind of sank in and made sense is i had the opportunity in november of 2013 i attended what's called lci congress so lci is the lean construction institute they're kind of the governing body of the last planner system and those lean tools and methodologies um, that we talk about a lot and they had their annual conference in dallas and i remember going to that conference seeing all kinds of amazing presentations of how other firms uh, and teams are leveraging these tools. And I remember specifically the keynote um, was an author as well as the founder of a company. His name was Paul Akers. He was famous for, um, he owns a company called FastCap who kind of originated the, when you're doing millwork construction, the little laminate caps you put over the screw holes when you're installing uh, cabinets. Um, and then grew that firm uh, into creating all types of, of uh, millwork type tools. Um, very progressive, very innovative. And he was a keynote and delivered this message on two second lean. And the premise was how to create a culture within an organization uh, that was just curious and consistently tried to eliminate waste and fix what bugs them. And then they would document these changes through small, quick 20, 30 second videos um, to kind of get the momentum, the groundswell of creating that culture within lean. So it was at that Congress, I think I came back. I remember creating some two second videos because I just immediately started seeing waste in the way that our job sites were performing and even what I was doing and how I would organize and set up a gang box over here. Or why I put the Connex, you know, 500 yards away from where the work was going. And I was seeing my trade partner foreman as well as my own foreman having to walk all the way across a laydown yard to go get some tools. And, and it just really transformed 
the manner in which I looked at work. Um, and that's really where that passion and, and that, that journey began. Okay. So along the way, the IC you must have, you, 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 you met Mr. Zandi, Kian, in the established yep. relationship. So when yep. did this concept, as far as lean in, turn it into a book? It's been more importantly a novel. Come yeah. Out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let me back up. So Keon and I, um, our journey started at Lindbeck together. Uh, I think in 2015, uh, that's when Keon transitioned uh, and started his journey over at Scouts. And, and we kept in, in touch and we were constantly seeing each other you know, at LCI community of practice events in Dallas, or, or maybe at a LCI Congress. And we were constantly just still sharing notes about, you know, how our teams are doing, how are things going. And we always had this need of creating some type of tool to help really explain where to start and how to build on a lean journey relative to, uh, you know, our teams. And it was really out, out of selfish need to really empower our teams and to find a way to put a roadmap and a framework together of how to start a lean journey. Is at the time within kind of the, the lean community, there was a lot of great resources that were out there like Toyota Way and Two Second Lean, um, you know, those publications. But everything was very academic. It was very research based. You know, it was uh, coming from manufacturing or it was something, uh, you know, that was on a white paper coming out of UC Berkeley or UC Davis. And it just wasn't it just wasn't packaged in a manner that the man or woman in the field putting the work in place our trade partner leaders, as well as our, our general contracting teams would would, would consume content, would, would want to learn. We're just struggling with that. Um, and it was interesting. So in 2017, LCI's convention was in Anaheim, California. And I remember flying out there. I hopped on a Southwest flight and I'm boarding the plane and I see Keon on the left side of the plane and, and we connect and we move a few rows back so we can sit by each other and we're, we're flying out and we're talking about, you know, what we're excited about, what we're looking forward to seeing at Congress. And maybe this is the year we're going to find that tool or that resource that helps us uh, communicate these tools and principles more effectively to our team members. And, you know, honestly, we're, we're, we're probably, uh, we're probably over New Mexico, maybe getting into Arizona. Maybe we've had a couple Miller lights and we're sitting there and we're talking <laughs> and we're like, why are we waiting on someone else to create this tool? We understand lean tools. We understand these principles that we're trying to share. What if we create the tool to try to communicate that? And at first our mind kind of just, we pulled out the, the safety manual on the plane and we're looking for like, well, what if we just make a, you know, something they can like fold up and it's, you know, very infographic, you know, explainer video type of, yeah. well, here's step one, daily huddles. Here's step two, make all your communication visual. Here's step three, manage constraints as a team. Oh, step four, here's how we'll show them you know, how to implement last planner system. Um, and we thought we were on to something. Like we thought we just like we're reinventing the wheel. This is going to be awesome. This is the next big thing. We got lightning in a bottle. Like here we go. And then we go to that convention and Paul Akers, the author of, of uh, I'm sorry, not Paul Akers, Patrick Lencioni. Uh, if you're familiar with, with Pat Lencioni, um, great business mind, uh, consultant, wrote Ideal Team Player, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, Death by Meeting, a lot of great books. But he illustrates his principles through a fable format within, within a fictional body of work. So he was there giving his keynote. He was talking about Ideal Team Player, Humble, Hungry, Smart Model. I'm, like, I'm blown away. Like I see this keynote. I'm absolutely blown away go buy his book, read his book. And I remember uh, calling Keon. I'm like, Hey man, it's not a, it's not a manual. It's not a pamphlet. I really think we need to try to write a book about this stuff. And he's like, you're crazy. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and I said, not even, not even a book. What, what if it's a, what if it's a fictional book? And he's like, you're even more crazy. Like that. <laughs> and really that, that's how the whole, the, the premise behind the book and it was really the the it was created in such a way how can we package this content in such a manner that our, our trade partners our field leaders would be engaged would want to consume that content and we felt by telling a very engaging story we might be able to demonstrate the tools and the principles as well as demonstrate the value that they can build um for their projects and their teams you know, I got to take on two points there. As a you know, aspiring writer, somewhat you know, amateur writer, um, you mentioned comments as far as I have a couple um, 
adult beverages over at New Mexico to help get yeah. going. Sure. I kind of make that equation as far as like, you know, to the similarity we talk swing juice, you know, in golf for me, it's you know, oh, yeah. creative, creative juice when I'm trying to knock out a newsletter or an idea. <laughs> um, and then, so to the point, though, like with the book itself, I mean, honestly, writing a, I mean, hell, for me, writing a newsletter would be complicated. I mean, it takes a couple hours. I mean, writing a book, I mean, that's going to take time. And both you guys will have full time jobs. You're, you know, leaders in your firms, leaders out in the industry. How, how'd that work? Uh, it was a lot of nights and a lot of weekends. Uh, it was about a year and a half process of getting the, the, what was in our heads. Uh, down on paper, you know, we, we kind of created a framework, uh, a skeleton of how we want to introduce the principles and the tools. Um, and then the, you know, the tough part was really kind of weaving that and, and putting that together in an engaging story. Um, you know, we would kind of take turns, we divvy up chapters that we kind of felt more passionate about and kind of knock out the the writing of the chapter. And then we would come back on a weekend, get together and, and go through uh, the body of work and kind of make sure we fleshed it out appropriately, then hand it over to our uh, editor who did a fantastic job of uh, making sure that the, the story lined and it made sense. So it was, it was a huge lift, but it, you know, it's interesting to note that like once we got started in, in the, in the process, it's like everything was already in our head. And like, once we got that momentum and we started to see the progress made, it just kind of continued to pour out uh, and to flow out. But it, it was a, it was a heavy lift, no doubt. It was, it was a lot of work, but uh you know, it, it's funny. I think that process definitely solidified. I, I don't think we'll ever <laughs> write another book. I don't know if I can so, go through. There's no sequel? There's no Lean Bitter Tea? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> no, there's no sequel anytime soon. I, I don't know if I can, I can go through that lift again. It was it was pretty good. Fair, Fair enough. So obviously the audience, I mean, if you've seen, you can obviously uh, through our portal here on LinkedIn submit questions to Joe. If you have any questions specific you want me to ask, I'll be happy to pass them along. Uh, you know, Joe, I kind of walked walk, walk backwards. My career has been pretty much you know, insurance and risk most of my life. And then, you know, before I joined um, Austin Injuries and what's heavy to work on construction, I work for a large F -F firm called FN Global Commercial Property. And my job then was to work with my clients, travel the country, the world, understand their operations, and try to understand where are the things that could go wrong in the middle of the night that could impact their operations. And one of the things is like it's supply chain. So yeah. like I was, my, my colleagues and I, we were talking about supply chain before, everybody, before it was cool. And I think what I like specifically about your book and then the COVID, I think reinforced it. But a, a project is basically manufacturing at a location. And a yeah. lot of moving parts have to, to be done in a, in a sequence to get things done properly because one sub has to do this and the next sub can do that and along the way it goes. And not to give away the, the who, who, who you know, not to say the butler did it in the book, I don't want to give it away, but I like the very end of the book specifically because it reinforces the fact that if you miss that one last component yeah. that does not make the, the building's occupancy cert happen, yeah. then you're going to have a problem. And especially the way that book was designed, it needed to be there the next day. <laughs> Yeah. Everything has to be ready. Yeah, you're talking yeah. about the doors. You're talking about yes, the I doors. <laughs> the yeah. simple thing is the doors and the access controls. Yeah. 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 But that's it that had to be done. And those had to be done in order for the cert to be, to be generated by the county, whatever, so that the owner could take occupancy, so that therefore you have a big party and everybody's happy the next day. And that's, that's what's right. I mean, that's that's and I think that's specifically what I like about this book is trying to have people understand, especially yeah, I didn't do frontline construction, but I, I understand at least how it works. And that there are a lot of things that have to be done in order. And yep. if something goes wrong in like, the critical path, it can daisy chance throughout the organization. And that's why I like the lean concept as far as you take it from, okay, what's it look like the day it's finished? And you walk backwards all the steps that have to be done yep. in order to get a complete occupation. And I actually did, I'm such a believer in that concept. I actually wrote a newsletter recently about how applying lean principles should be done on your insurance renewal because I don't give much insurance show to me sorry to hear like you get the cert at the last second the policy the last second everybody's crunching trying to get your you know updated certs and people go on the job site so you want to walk it backwards from all the things that could go back go to go haywire so that you yes. identify these things along the critical path so everybody's on the same team marching toward the same objective now that's why I'm a big fan of this book uh, I I appreciate that it's um it's so interesting how I think the vast majority of our industry treats 
a construction project like a race. Uh, and it's not a race. It's a team sport. Everyone has to cross that seal finish line at the same time. And, and I would, even to this day, I would probably say, I would argue that probably 90% of the projects in our, in our, uh, country, in our industry, um, you know, it's the first one on whoever can get on site, get their work done the fastest, get their stuff in the ceiling and get out of sight. Um, you know, they'll change order everyone else to death and they got there, you know, they won, they were successful. Um, and it's not, and, and the model that I think is, is the right model that our industry should be shifting for is those field leaders, those superintendents, their coaches, it's a team sport and the trade partners are the players. And it's our job to be able to facilitate the collaboration and communication to help coordinate that effort to go through where we all finish at the same time uh, and make it um, an enjoyable experience along the way as well. And I, so, I love your illustration. I just want one more point. I, I love your yeah. illustration about pulling back for being able to have a policy ready to go. And that's the same thing that we uncover on, on a weekly basis within our projects. So you go have a pool session, you know, on a project and you're trying to validate a milestone of, you know, getting finishes done in the building. And, and I can't tell you how many pools I've been a part of, especially like in our current state of the supply chain where we're, we're, we're in there, we got our, we're, we're planning, we got, you know, finishes or we're, we're all excited because we get done pulling and the finishes are, you know, going to be done six weeks ahead of when we originally thought in the CPM schedule. Then here comes our mechanical trade partner to say, well, that's all fine and good, but our air handler still 54 weeks out. So, I mean, there's mm -hmm. no point in, in having to do this. Like, let's really understand what are the key levers? What do we really need to understand about our project and how we're going to be successful and know that early on within that process so that we can have the right plans in place to be successful. Yeah, and I, I'll just build on that. Like, say for me, when I'm talking to clients or talking teams and trying to, you know, figure out when, when the renewal is due and when we're trying to get things done, you pull it backwards. Well, like, one of the, there's a couple of things, events, there's plenty of events that happen every year, like strictly lean construction, that a lot of people attend to in the, in the construction world, insurance world, is it's the big, what we call Fermi, which is a big construction risk conference. It's like a week. This year was in Vegas. And like, that was the week of March. And you, you, nothing's going to happen that week, guys. So you need us. Assume yeah. that we that is, we're losing a week in production that week, so you got to take that into the count into the uh, into the project. That's try identify all those things that could you know delay getting you know work being pr proceeding as normal. And that's I think that's the, the beautiful thing about the lean concept. And and so I I, I made this comment to you, so Joe. But I want to I'll say this before I let your feedback. So Joe, I, I yeah I know I told you I read this book and recently I was I went and did a, a visit at a job site. Um, general contractor Texan member that was doing a project very near my house you know, I could actually walk to and I showed up with a you know box of hot rolls hot sausages for the um, sausage rolls for the the team so I know about nothing about construction yeah being the superintendent in the team that's right and right there on the right there on the, on the C, uh, project manager's book on this table was a copy of your book so that was like a little point of conversation oh, for the two cool. of us. yeah so I'm curious, you know, how has the book been received? And what is, like, you know, I, I imagine this is probably not the only podcast, you know, webcast you've done on this. How's it been received so far? Um, it's, it's pretty humbling. Uh, it, it far exceeded any expectations that I think we ever had for it. You know, as I kind of alluded early on, it was really wrote for selfish reasons to be able to help uh, our own teams and communicate internally uh, with our own teams and, and how to improve implementing these tools and these methodologies and how do we really uh, make our lowest performing job raise that bar you know i always say relative to safety on a project you're only as good as your lowest performing job so if you have one superintendent that doesn't enforce safety glasses they just effectively lowered the bar for the rest of the company and we looked at lean the same way um but you know it, it has uh, totally surpassed any type of expectation that i think keon and i really had for the book uh, and it's been very humbling to see the value um, that other firms and team members um, who are just tired of the current state, tired of this function, tired of all the pain and all the BS that comes along with our industry and just equipping them with a set of tools and resources to allow them to improve the value uh, of their day, to have a better quality of life, to hopefully improve not only the relationships on the job site, but maybe their relationships at home. Uh, with their wife, with their kids, and so on, just because they're able to have more meaningful work and work and not be just living in that constant firefighting reactive state uh, of frustration every day on the job site.
Brian, I can't. No, I was on, I was on, yeah, I was on mute. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Just feel it. Trying to keep, right. keep the background noise down. So I appreciate so right, that. So now, uh, I'm going to take on, build on to that question you asked. But Dane Wilkins asked a question What is the book's name? So, Dane, I'm going to try to put this on the screen so you can see it. It is actually called The Lean Builder A Builder's Guide to Amazing Lean Tools in the Field. And this, I bought this on Amazon, downloaded to my Kindle, and you can obviously do the same as well. So, um, you know, Joe, I know you're limited on time here. So I, the one thing I wanted to sort of talk about, and for people back in who are watching this, maybe aren't construction or maybe they're insurance or risk, is you and I talked about this, which I think is a great thing about this, because lean is a concept that should be about a project, you know, a team. And part of this is like reducing errors, reducing uh, inefficiencies, and reducing, like, say, part of it, like, you know, you, you want to make a nice, clean work environment so you're reducing slip and falls or injuries. And then that, to me, yeah. is like, that's yeah. like, that's beneficial from, like, obviously you don't want to have incidents because you want to get things rolling in on time. But my side of the fence, like, well, that's the kind of thing you want to see client being proactive, thinking about their work environment and holistically. So, therefore, A, you reduce any potential risk from a yeah. worker's comp journal liability perspective. And then also you're trying to think about what can be done as far as any sort of, because not everything's insurable, but if there's a way to help our clients make sure there's not any, you know, liquefied damages, costs, overruns, because you're not hitting your target, not opening the doors on time. It, it, that's in my mind. I think lean is a great tool into the overall concept of enterprise risk management. And obviously it's, this is for construction, but I think it can be applied to almost any industry. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I'll, I'll expand on that point. You know, lean was probably one of the three pillars within our organization at Limbeck that allowed us to achieve, you know, the safety metrics that allowed us to win the national AGC award, the overall award in 2021. It was one of the, wow. the three legs of that stool. Um, and I, I think the reason why is like when you boil it down, like at its simplest form, <clears throat> lean's all about respect for people. Okay. It's about the elimination of waste. And it's about fixing what bugs you, overcoming, you know, seeing the waste and fixing it. And uh, those cultural tendencies, uh, you know, within our projects, when, when we can effectively visually communicate the work that's taking place and every trade partner at that daily huddle understands what every other trade partner is doing. And we have a, a, a place on our visual dashboards or, you know, that we call the safety focus point. And for every activity and commitment that's made that week, there's a specific line item that talks about what's the one or two things that we need to be aware of, of how we're going to effectively manage the risk in that activity to make sure that we can execute that work safely. And just having those discussions in the awareness allows everyone to just have greater uh, overall understanding of the work and how it's taking place, which leads to uh, having better results uh, for safety in the field. But it, it all boils down to having that culture um, and having just the drive and the focus to fix the fix the waste, eliminate that waste, fix what bugs you, and ultimately yeah. treat each other with respect. Because at the end of the day, um, it's the respect for the individual and respect for the leaders that allows you to, to – care and allow you to want to make sure that you know your trade partners and your, your team members are going home at the end of every day and returning to their families and coming back um and to be able to do their job so i think there's a natural correlation between uh lean and being able to achieve uh excellent safety results on a project which ultimately uh head us down in the right direction where we all need to be going Amen. I love it. The risk manager's perspective. I love hearing that kind of stuff. That's fantastic. So, Joe, I, I know we're about to wrap up on time here, but let's, before we wrap up, it's sure. like Joe spent a little time. Like, so, obviously, you're an author, you're in construction, leader in construction. But, Joe, what are you doing when you're not working? Um, so, when I'm not working, I have four kids. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I have a. Uh, at this point in time, I have a 12-year-old, a 9-year-old, a 7-year-old, all boys, and then I have wow. a daughter who's four, uh, wow. Karsten, Kaiser, Knox, and Crosby. And nice. um, I, I literally probably don't have, you know, you know, I used to I used to love to hunt, used to love to fish, used to love to you play should. golf. Now, <laughs> now I find myself doing what my kids do. But, you know, it's interesting. My, my uh, children are starting to get to the age, especially my two oldest boys, where I'm starting to introduce them to the passions uh, that I – 
you know, used to be engaged in like hunting and fishing and yeah. golfing and all that fun. That's stuff. Great. So, yeah. um, but, but my passion really is uh, centered around my wife and my children and, and uh, creating meaningful experiences and just doing life in general with them. So that Amen. I got a full Amen. plate. So in this season, in this season of life, it's just rock and roll. So when you have the ability to go do a little travel with the family, where do you guys go? You know, we uh, we love to ski and we love the beach. So we, oh, we okay. try to align our uh, our we, we try to take two trips a year and uh, we like to hit the mountains uh, right around this time, spring break. Yeah. Uh, and then in the summertime, we have some family up in the panhandle of Florida and uh, we typically will make the drive out there and hang out with our family in uh, yeah. Florida and spend some time at the beach and doing some fishing. And that's kind of the the normal routine that we have seemed to kind of fallen in the rhythm of where do you normally ski because i just came back from breckridge two weeks ago and it was a good week so uh wolf wolf creek is our okay. uh mount of choice in southern okay. california or southern california southern colorado yeah and uh, we love the town of pagosa springs it just kind of is that quintessential little mountain town and uh, okay. love spending time at pagosa springs yeah and uh finally so you're an author so what books would you recommend whether it be what, what if you're like what are your favorite books whether it be construction or anything else what are some of your favorite books that you, you seem to appreciate now that you're an author oh man um we're gonna need like 10 more minutes for this <laughs> uh, well, give me a couple <laughs> yeah so uh atomic habits james clear is one that i read every year just okay. it helps me focus on the things that i want identifying myself as the the, the person that has the traits that I want to become and it helps me kind of put that framework of achieving the goals that I want through my behavior and, and changing my thought process. Um, the go giver Bob Berg uh, kind of totally transformed my mindset in um, it's just easy as a human being to just always be egocentric and thinking about yourself versus having a heart that's really focused on um, serving others. And I think through the process and act of serving others, uh, ultimately, you, you just kind of continue to um, increase your influence of sphere and having the type of results within your life, whether however you define that to be. Um, man, uh, essentialism, Greg McEwen. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I read another book that was very similar, although I would kind of consider essentialism more of a secular version, I, more of, from a, a faithful perspective. I just finished reading The Ruthless Illumination of Hurry. Uh, heard about it from my church. It was uh, a pretty interesting book. Uh, just constantly trying to find opportunities within my own life of, you know, how can I push aside the noise and really focus on the things that need to be focused on and prioritizing? Because uh, it's just so easy to get wrapped up and in, in anxious about all the stuff on your plate when you're thinking yeah. about busy professional career. How do I be a good husband? How do I be a good father? How do I be a good friend? Um, there's just a lot to juggle. And I think both of those books have helped me kind of find the rhythm of how I go through that balance. That's awesome. So That's awesome. I, I could keep going, but I think maybe that gives you four, four, to, go, four to go check out. Well, I think you got to hit the road to Houston. So Joe, I greatly appreciate for your time. Thank you for taking a little time on your busy day to talk to us and uh, safe, safe, safe travels out there, sir. Appreciate it, Brian. Thanks for the opportunity, man. Take care. Yeah, take care. All right, everybody. So I was hopefully you enjoyed that conversation, Joe, Joe Namrimo. Um, again, the name of the book is called The Lean Builders, A Builder's Guide to Replying Lean Tools in the Field, written by both Joe Donarimo and Keon Zandu. Um, I bought my uh, Amazon, download my Kindle. I'm sure you could do the same thing or you can just get a hard copy. Um, again, I hope you found this episode enjoyable. I hope you found it informative. This episode will be available to you here on LinkedIn for a while, and then also within the week, it'll be pushed transferred over to my YouTube channel. Um, as always, if you have any questions or comments, or you'd like to see some uh, topics or individuals on this channel, please let me know. Um, you can also subscribe to all these past episodes at uh, my YouTube channel, which is called 60 Seconds of Risk. And you can also, if you need to, find links to these on Twitter. And if you got nothing better to do, you can subscribe to my uh, Substack newsletter, Risk at All. Um, Again, on behalf of everyone who's involved with the show, which is just right now me, <laughs> Team Home One, I want to thank everybody for their time. Um, Eli, thank you for your comment. I appreciate that. And, you know, we'll talk to you next month. Bye, everybody.